Good morning. I know we can do better than that. Good morning. It is great to see you guys. Welcome. If uh, you're joining us on live stream, we want to welcome you as well. Let me read this, uh, these words found in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, uh, starting in verse 5. It says, for there is one God. Do you believe that this morning? Amen. Amen. There is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. Let's worship him together. If you would stand to your feet and let's praise him in song. Voice in the dark, a song that lights up the stars, one breath that gives life, one sovereign in power, who speaks with thunder and fire. seen the glory of the one and only Son of God, and we have seen the glory of the one and only Son of God. Yes, we have seen the glory of the one and only Son. offering this morning. Hallelujah. You may be seated. Amen. It is so nice to see everyone. Uh, this service and the first service too. Some one, folks of you have been wondering how things are going. Well, you know, we've got these uh, spots designated because of the social distancing. And for the last couple weeks, I've made the observation that if you put everybody coming in the first time and the second time together, we'd actually have more people than the slots we have. 
Uh, and so I wanted you to be aware of that, that it's working. We're trying to do our part to uh, keep things moving along and getting back to a new normal. And uh, the first service that we've been having has been a key part of that. Uh, there's still room to spread out up top, and there's room in that first service. It's probably about a third, two-thirds, or uh, 20%, 80%, first to the second, or uh, et cetera. So uh, if you want to come even earlier and then to Sunday school, you can do that as well. I wanted to let you know the options you have. Continue to be safe. Continue to be careful. Uh, there is something to this thing. It's actually uh, relapping around the country and around the world, and there's not a vaccine yet, so uh, just be smart, you know. And especially you guys. Guys are gross. Um, and guys don't wash their hands like they should. And nothing you can do will be better for you to, than to really wash your hands a whole lot, particularly you guys that don't do that as much, because it, there actually are more guys with COVID around the world than ladies. And it's partly because you don't wash your hands, you gross guy, so do that. Well, uh, the children's reading program, there's Mary Mounts over there, and the Ch Tabbury Children's uh, July reading program with a fishing theme is off to a great start. Some of the kids from the first service got their books, and those that are here now, you'll want to get yours on the way out there at the library if you didn't get them on the way in. And looking forward to all the different teams named after fishing things, fish kinds of fish. Uh, hope you, uh, uh, your team wins. Um, and also tonight, 6 o'clock, if you can come, we're going to play softball out on the field. It's been mowed, it's been dragged, and we'd love to have you there. At the end of the summer, we're going to feed you. Not now, uh, but I uh, hope you can come out and play and have that good time. All the different sports things we're doing are do going really well with the basketball on Tuesday, the volleyball on Thursday nights, and the kickball, et cetera, soccer, et cetera, for kids on Wednesdays. Uh, thank you for your support of all those things. We are this coming Wednesday going to resume the choir. Not so much anticipating that they'll sing next week or even in the next month, but because this is the, you know, we have such a great ministry team with choir, we want them to be able to get together and fellowship and worship. We also know that the choir is a, a, a component of risk to it and stuff, and so we're going to let them meet in here Wednesday night so they can you know, socially distance and then some, you know, as they have their study and their prayer time and uh, also uh, get ready to sing as they can over these months to come. And so choir's in here Wednesday night, youth group's in the youth room, and the Wednesday night Bible study slash prayer meeting is in the fellowship hall, and so make a note of it. Next Sunday night at my house, I think the address has been up here or is in your directory, you can call and get it. I don't think I'll put it out online. So, but next Sunday is our annual picnic at our house, and we'd love to have you come. You bring yourself, bring a chair, bring something to eat, bring a little extra for Percy, our dog, and um, we will provide the drink, church will provide the drinks, and we'll have a good time. Starts at 6 next Sunday night at our house in Ringgold, and again, if you don't know the address, contact us, we'll give that to you. Now, we want to be um, in celebration here for uh, Malcolm and Deborah Ferris. 50 years of marriage yesterday. Give them a round of applause. Now, sometime in the last two months with all this uh, COVID stuff, we have had somebody else. There was another couple that had a 50th anniversary. Are you here today? And we did not yet recognize you as a church. Yes. How many, Harry and uh, Maybell? 50. 50? <laughs> Praise the Lord. Oh, look over here. Another couple. <laughs> is that uh yeah okay you know it's dickie and yvonne right yeah it's just hard to see from here all right praise the lord give them a hand of applause too and let's pray for david thompson david preached so well here last week that he's at woodlawn this week preaching uh and so let's pray for him as he does an outdoor service there and of course alan did their drive in last week this week they're trying to do an outdoor service and so let's pray for him there let's go to the lord in prayer Father, we thank you so much for the truth of your word. We thank you for the love of the Holy Spirit that just, uh, when we get together, two or three or more gathered, Lord, the Jesus that's inside one of us responds to the Jesus that's inside another. And there is worship, God. And there's prayer, and there's concern, and there's fellowship, and there's ministry. Lord, thank you for your plan to put believers together in churches, God. 
And even though during this time we have some that it's just still not the best move to come out uh, to worship uh, corporately, Lord God, we thank you that they're joining with us online. Uh, Lord, thank you for the great talk I had with Pastor Lamar this past week, Lord. And, and he and Debbie might be among those at home now watching. Lord, we pray that you'd continue to bless them and all those uh, that uh, really want to get to the other side of this. And we want to do it very smartly, Lord God. We pray you continue to guide and lead as you alone can do. And Lord, as this is July 4th week, we thank you so much for the, the, the way you led our founding fathers, uh, the Declaration of Independence, the clear statement that all men are created equal. We've got unalienable, unalienable rights because of our great Creator God. Lord, thank you for how that overflowed into the Constitution and into the First and Second Amendments and all the ways that even though we've never ever in this country experienced the ideal, thank you that those ideals were based on a firm belief that there is a God that we'll all give an account to. And so, Lord, whether it was the original founder's vision to do better because of that creation, Lord, or whether it was great men like Martin Luther King Jr., Lord, who reminded us that we had put things in the Declaration and Constitution we weren't experiencing as a nation, Thank you for their heart to get back to and live up to those ideals. There are examples of many things going wrong, Lord, but we thank you that uh, there's something to shoot for because of our great founding, Lord, that we can look back with and build on, Lord God. And I pray that will continue to be true for everyone in this room as individuals, as a church, and as a nation. Help us to be proactive in glorifying you and doing good by our fellow man and getting the gospel to non-believers and helping our fellow believers grow. We love you, Lord. Will you be the guest of honor now, Lord, in this place? Thank you for the way you've blessed us these last few months, the way that we aren't waiting till this is done, but even during this time, we're experiencing you, God. We pray the same will be true now. We do pray that as we think of July 4th, we do also think of 2 Chronicles seven fourteen, And we do pray Lord, nothing happens good through pride. You want us to humble ourselves before you. You want us to say the same thing about our sins that your word does, God. And when we humble ourselves before you, acknowledge our sins and repent of them and seek your face, you promise your forgiveness and your presence. Oh, how our churches need that. Oh, how I need that. Our churches need that. Our land needs that, God. Won't you send us a, an awakening in our land? That can only be explained because of your kindness, your mercy, your grace. And God, for each of us, may we ask, if revival depended on me, would it come? I pray that we'll do that work of introspection this July 4th so that we'll be part of your solution for our nation and world going forward. In Christ's name I pray. Continue to worship the Lord in song. I want you to use this song as an amen to what Dr. Campbell just prayed. To accomplish that, how many believe that we need the Lord? We do. I want to ask another question a little more pointed. Do you know that you individually it's easy for us to kind of escape in the crowd, isn't there? Like, yep, yeah, we sure do. And what do we really mean? <laughs> they do, Lord. They need some help. No, but if we're honest, if we're real, I say, Lord, here am I. And I need you. Oh, how I need you. Every hour of the day, I need you. So my prayer is that this song is just that. It's a clarion call. It's a prayer to God. It's, it's a declaration. God, I need you. I need revival in my life so that I can be part of your revival work here in my country, in my state, in my city and county. So won't you, won't you join me? Make this your prayer. Stand with me as we continue to worship in song.
sin runs deep, your grace is more, where grace is found, is where you are, where you phone here. As they sing this song, and they're going to sing it so nicely, uh, as I just look out, there are so many people in this room that have so many uh, hurts and heartaches and serious things you're facing, or somebody you know, where even death is a possibility. Um, won't you be extra careful, even as you are uh, being led in this song by them, to think of specific people and pray for them during this time? from me Oh how much 
see the love for Jesus on those countenances, couldn't you? Turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 11. Acts chapter 11. And as you turn there, I want to tell you about uh, some things from happened to me earlier in life that were a great blessing. When I was 19 years of age, uh, it was the end of my sophomore year at Bryan College, a friend named John Pierce, a few years older than me, he was actually on the church staff as a counselor, uh, he let me live for him during the entire summer after my sophomore year. And he was working with youth at a local church, and he invited me, he dragged me. Uh, I went with him over to work with youth with him at that church. Uh, there wasn't any pay involved, um, but what a chance to take what I had been learning and teach it to others. And God blessed us, youth were saved, they had discipled, the youth group grew, some of those kids went into the ministry as the years passed, and it was a tremendous uh, experience for me who had done a little to do a little bit more, and John Pierce made that possible by pulling me into it, recruiting me into it. A couple years later when I was 21, I had graduated from Bryan College, I got a job as a recruiter for the school. Over the next three years I traveled 100,000 miles to Florida, North and South Carolina, Virginia, Maryland, D.C., those were my states. I spoke a thousand times during those three years about Jesus, Christian education, Bryan College in particular, uh, and became a, a much better speaker during that time. And uh, God had said no to the job I wanted to give me the one that would stretch me and help me grow. But when I was in town, I went to an independent Baptist church, and there a dear brother pastor named Bill Smithson approached me, and he invited me when I was in to go out on visitation with him on Tuesdays. And I did, and I'd see how he led people to Jesus. I got to be part of that too. Increasingly, he would drive me there, and I'd be the one that do most of the sharing. It kind of went from 100% him, 0% me, to vice versa, and him smiling and praying as I'd get to lead people to Jesus there. And back at the church, he would actually have me teach some and preach some. And, you know, he also had me lead music some. Good gracious, that was an epic fail, you know, because of my key range and my being off key this way, that way, the other, you know. Um, and, uh, but but he was, what he was doing was he'd give me more responsibility, more chances to serve, more opportunities to see where God might have me uh, place in the future. Two-way encouragement was there. We saw adults saved, youth saved, children saved. We would take the vans, and just like our Awana ministry goes and brings people in, we would go on those back roads in Tennessee there, and it looked like third-world countries, some of the places we would drive through as we'd go back and get those kids and bring them uh, to the church and see them be part of the children's ministry there. A few years later, when I was 25 and newly married, Elizabeth and I went to Denver to start seminary. I finished at Southeastern, but I started at Denver Seminary over in Colorado. While we were there, we went to a Southern Baptist church. That's the kind of church I'd been saved in. Seems like for me, it always comes back to Bible church type things or independent Baptist church type things or Southern Baptist church type things. That's kind of who I am in the circles I've run in. 
But there was an associate pastor of youth and education there, education and youth, I should say. His name was Kelly Vaughn, and he had kids in the youth group. And Kelly recruited me and uh, call, uh, started having me do things with the youth. Increasingly, I'd do a little bit more. He would do a little bit less. He really liked focusing in on his education role at the church, and so pretty soon he was calling me the youth uh, intern. And the difference between a youth pastor and a youth intern is the money. Uh, they gave me just a little bit there, you know, as time went along. But I wasn't doing it for the money and hadn't started out that way. And what a great experience to teach and lead with Kelly, to learn from him, to do things together. It was so wonderful, that experience. And, um, and God blessed us. Souls were saved and discipled again. There are people in the ministry today because of that time we had together there. I'm so glad that each of those men recruited me to serve alongside them in a position. And increasingly were mentoring me to uh, grow in the faith and also have opportunities to be fruitful. Our mission statement at the Tabernacle is to reproduce faithful and fruitful followers of Jesus Christ. And those men were doing that in my life. Folks, as I look back on those early opportunities the Lord gave me to grow and serve, I'm so thankful for those guys seeing something in me and adjusting their own time to include me in the ministry. I didn't understand then what I do understand now. It took a lot of sacrifice on their parts to include me in what they were doing. Isn't it so much easier to do something yourself in life, in business, in church? Oftentimes when you include others, they don't do it exactly the way you want it done, right? Uh, and they might get the job done, but you're kind of irritated a little bit because it's not exactly how you wanted it done. It's so much easier just to do it yourself than to include others. They had to adjust to include me. They had to make sacrifices to include me. Others asked, why aren't you doing the job? We're paying you to do it. Why are you having this guy come in that, that we don't know and, and is growing along with you? All those different things were in there. It takes time and energy to develop others even as you're doing the ministry yourself. But if we're ever going to raise up the next generation of workers, it's absolutely critical. The need says we need to do it, and going forward in the next generation says we need to do it. But there's an even greater reason to do it, because it's exactly what we see Jesus doing in the Gospels and the apostles doing in the pages of the New Testament, Acts on out to Revelation. So, Acts chapter 11. Let's look at how Barnabas did that for Saul. Barnabas did that for Saul. Barnabas first appears in Acts chapter 4. Uh, they were selling things. People with things were selling things so needs could get met within the life of the body. Barnabas sold a field he owned, gave the proceeds to the church, and the church used those to meet the needs of the poor that were among them. They were so encouraged by Barnabas' love and sacrifice that they um, actually started calling him Barnabas. His real name was Joseph. He was from Cyprus, the island in the Mediterranean. And he was a, from a Levite background. But they just started calling him son of encouragement. That's what Barnabas means, Mr. Encouragement. And here we see him again. We've already seen his role in Saul's life once. We're going to see it again here today. Verse 19. Now those who were scattered after the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, preaching the word to no one but the Jews only. They all had Jewish backgrounds up to that point. They felt most comfortable witnessing to Jews, and so that's what they did. But some of them were men from Cyprus and Cyrene, who when they had come to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists, so Greek Gentiles, Greek-speaking Gentiles, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned to the Lord. Then news of those things came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem. I was cracking myself up in the first service as I was reading this. I was thinking about a church having ears on the outside. But the ears were the people, right? The ears, of the, the ears of the church in Jerusalem. And they sent out Barnabas to go as far as Antioch. When he came and had seen the grace of God, he was glad. And encouraged them all that with a purpose of heart, with purpose of heart they should continue with the Lord. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And a great many people were added to the Lord. Then Barnabas departed for Tarsus to seek Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. So it was that for a whole year they assembled with the church and taught a great many people. And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. Saul gets recruited. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for how for 2,000 years believers have been including other believers in the work that you wanted them to do. The gospel has reached new people 
multiplication has happened and the baton has been passed from Paul's, from Barnabas's to Paul's to Timothy's to beyond to faithful men and women for 2,000 years. Thank you, Lord, for how it's so well modeled for us, God. We think of how we've seen Saul growing, getting saved and growing in the messages before this. And now we see you took a man that was already being faithful in little things and gave him a much broader and wider sphere of influence, God. And it was all possible because Barnabas included him in the work. Lord, may we be both Barnabases who get others involved in the work, but also Saul's that say yes when our opportunity comes. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, folks, this is the fourth message in a little series I'm doing called Facing Life with the Apostle Paul. Uh, Saul lived, Saul, Paul, Saul was the Jewish background name. He could also use Paul, which is his Roman background name. He had both of those things. He was uh, Hebrew speaking and Greek speaking, so he could function in both worlds. And so how God used Saul and raised him up. We saw uh, first in the first message I did how Saul became a believer. It was 33 AD. Now that's making the assumption that Jesus died and rose from the dead and ascended to heaven in 30 AD. And scholars debate that some, but most scholars now think that happened in 30, not 33 AD. So three years later, Saul was converted. We saw that and how he was baptized and began walking with the Lord and sharing with those around him and started getting into trouble for doing that. That was 33 AD or so. We looked in our second message about how he was growing in Christ. For three years he went into the Arabian uh, wilderness and was trained by God, reading his scriptures, growing there, meeting together with just a few believers rather than a larger church body and those type things. It was a real time of training and growth for him. 36 AD or so he went to Jerusalem for the first time. Barnabas helped him be accepted by the apostles. He knew he was on the right track and he wound up through more persecution wound up back in Tarsus, his hometown, and that's where he's been. Last time we looked at something that happened in 41 AD, we believe or so. So he's been a Christian about eight years, where he did not get healed, but he did get a promise. And so Saul had a thorn in the flesh, and it was probably his bad eyesight. You've got a thorn in the flesh. It can be something spiritual, emotional, physical, something that you wish wasn't part of your life, but it has been part of your life. And as Saul intensely prayed and fasted three different times, he probably prayed all the time, but he said three times I asked the Lord to take away that thorn in the flesh, and it didn't happen. He didn't get healed, but he did get a promise that God's grace was sufficient for him. And even though his eyesight was always bad, it was always part of his story, just as for you... Something's always part of your story. You had cancer and got healed, but it's going to be part of your story for the rest of your life. Sometimes it comes back. People worry about that. We worry about that for us. It could be an unwanted divorce. It could be somebody that went to heaven, left this life far sooner than you wish they would be, the grief. It could be a lifelong depression based on your basic personality or some specific really hard things you've faced. There's a thorn in the flesh that has your name on it, and it doesn't always go away when we pray. Saul didn't get healed, but he did get a promise. My grace is sufficient for you. My power is perfected in weakness. And because of that, Saul had realized that he could particularly, probably minister to those that themselves had some kind of thorn in the flesh. He had an empathy that he otherwise wouldn't have had. And he had a compassion that he may have missed if everything had gone his way in life. And some of you are exactly there. Blessed be the God of all comfort, 2 Corinthians 1 says, who comforts us in the affliction that we go through so we can comfort others going through affliction. And that's hard. Life is hard. But God's met you there, and he can help you as you reach out to others. Well, today's passage brings us forward to about 45 A.D. Saul had been a believer for about a dozen years now. And nearly a decade, he'd been back in Tarsus, his home city, Cilicia. He was running his tent-making business, presumably, making money as a layman, serving the church as he could. Uh, he was a lifelong single man, we know from other passages. So was Barnabas, who we're going to see in a moment there. And Saul, as a single follower of Christ, was uh, doing all the things that would help him grow and serve his local church, maybe some churches around there. And he was a businessman. All that was happening. He was being faithful where he was. He was blooming where he planted. And that might have been all he ever did and never known to us again had it not been for Barnabas. 
While Saul was doing those things during that time, those years that passed, we can see that something was happening back in Antioch or in Antioch. So meanwhile, in the city of Antioch in Syria, verse 19 tells us, those who were scattered after the persecution that arose because of Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch. So Stephen was killed in 32 AD. He got killed there. Uh, it was martyrdom. He was stoned to death. And Saul was right there holding the robes as the guys did it to Stephen. Phoenicia would be what we now call Lebanon. Lebanon, north of Israel, west of Damascus in southern Syria. Cyprus, that's an island in the Mediterranean. Barnabas was from there, we learn. And this Antioch is the northern Syria Antioch. Later on his missionary journey, Saul's going to go to another Antioch, but this is Antioch in northern Syria. So, Jewish background believers took the gospel to Jews in those places. Now, one of the reasons they took the gospel to Jews in those places was they were going back to where they were from or they were going to the next place they had work. Uh, just as people go from one city to another city in America looking for work, the Roman Empire, a lot of people went from this big city to that big city following work. Uh, the difference is that we have more of a common culture in America and in the Roman Empire, my goodness, they had so many different cultures, things that had been own countries. It was much more like what happens in Europe today. Europe's trying to have one European Union together, but people speak French here and German here and other things, and they like their cultures, right? And so the Roman Empire basically went across all those cultures and now said, you're all Romans whether you like it or not. We're going to conscript, we're going to take your tax money, we're going to conscript you to service. And all that was happening. And so the cities, the big cities, became multicultural hubs of all kinds of different life and languages going on, just as our big cities in America are. And even in a smaller place like this, we've got multiple languages uh, around, but certainly not as much of the kind of cultural things they were experiencing in these big cities. Back to Acts Let's see how some of this had always been true, even back in Jerusalem. So Acts 6, the Hebrew-speaking apostles, uh, the Peters and the Johns and the Jameses, wanted to keep on preaching the word and praying. They had all kinds of needs to meet among the Jerusalem church. They raised up deacons. And the way they solved the problem, where it was mostly the minority community that had trouble with them, they raised up seven minority leaders and empowered them to meet the needs that were within their community. So Acts chapter 6, verse 5, the saying pleased the whole multitude. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit, and Philip, Procurus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch. That means he was a Gentile background person who had converted to Judaism and then met Jesus Christ. So he was also from this Hellenistic or Greek cultural background, but was now both a Jew and a follower of Christ, whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid hands on them. The word of God spread, the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. Verse 8, and Stephen... The deacon, full of faith and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. Then there arose some from what is called the synagogue of the freedmen. Look where they were from. Cyrenians, Alexandrias, and those from Cilicia and Asia disputing with Stephen. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. When they couldn't beat him, they beat him. When they couldn't beat him with words, they turned him over to the Sanhedrin. Stephen was stoned to death. Who do we know that was from Cilicia? The Apostle Paul, right? Back when he was Saul, he was there then, probably one of those disputing in Acts chapter 6. Then Acts 7 happened, Stephen's address, they stone him to death. They laid the garments at the feet of a young Sicilian man, Cilician man named Saul. C -c -c the other one's different, Sicily's different, that's Italy. Um, but anyway, so Cyrene was in North Africa in what is now called Libya, so an African man. Alexandria was in North Africa and Egypt, a northern African man. Saul was among those from Cilicia. Did you see there that Nicholas was a proselyte from Antioch? Makes you wonder if he was one of the ones that wound up back in Antioch later and helped the gospel get going there. Certainly he would have been aware of what Saul had done to fellow believers like Stephen. Uh, Saul's reputation preceded him. And we already saw that Saul had been on a trip after his conversion to Damascus in southern Syria to persecute Jews who had turned to Christ and 
drag them back to Jerusalem. And many of them, it looks like when you read between the lines, experienced death there back in Jerusalem. And Saul had been responsible for that. He had been a terrorist. But then he got converted. We've been studying his life. But some of them, look at verse 20. It says, some of them were men from Cyprus and Cyrene who, when they had come to Antioch, spoke to the Hellenists, preaching the Lord Jesus. They reached out to the Gentiles that weren't from a Jewish background and led them to Jesus. So isn't this interesting? Here we read that African-born Jews and Mediterranean-born Jews who became Christians in Jerusalem were among those winning Gentiles to the Lord in the northern city, Syria, of Antioch. This church was multicultural from the start. It was all they had experienced, and many good things were happening. And it says, the hand of the Lord was with them, just as he had promised in his great commission. You go, make disciples, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. You get to go, he'll take care of the low. Go low. Okay. Verses 22 to 24, the apostles sent Barnabas to organize the church at Antioch. Look at verse 22. It says, they, uh, they sent it says, when news of these things reached the ears of the church in Jerusalem, they sent out Barnabas to go as far as Antioch. From Jerusalem to Antioch, Barnabas, you just take a trip, and along the way, anybody you found that's believed in Jesus, hear their story, learn it, and tell us what you know. It made sense that they sent Barnabas. Some Christians from Cyprus area originally had originally been among those that planted the church there. They know Barnabas, who's from Cyprus. He's known for his encouragement. They send him. And he's got the time because he's uh, he got that extra time because he's single, doesn't have to bring his whole family along. So he goes up there and uh, reorients to be with them and to help them. Maybe Barnabas knew some of those Cyprus evangelists personally as he went. Well, I love those words about Barnabas in verses 23 and 24. In verse 24, we read three things about Barnabas. We see first that he was a good man. Now, you will not find it stated many times in the Bible that someone was a good man, a good person. The Bible doesn't put emphasis on our goodness. It puts emphasis on the greatness of God and says we are sinners who deserve judgment, but when we're saved, we're saved by God's grace. So why does it call Barnabas a good man? One of the very few places that happens. I think that's because Luke wrote this, and Paul later on was so tore up about a future conflict we'll see with Barnabas that he said, hey, when you talk about Barnabas, right in there he was a good man. But we don't have to guess what it takes to be a good man from the scriptures because of the next thing we read about Barnabas. It says, he was also full of the Holy Spirit. Now, when you become a believer, the Holy Spirit takes up residence in your heart. Ephesians 1 says, having believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit, that's your guarantee of your future inheritance. Many other passages talk about the Spirit of Christ being inside those who believe. The Holy Spirit indwells believers, but to be full of the Holy Spirit, you've got to do what the Bible says. Right? The Holy Spirit's going to lead you to the truth of the word, and you're going to see things in there that are sin. And so the filling of the Holy Spirit is the same thing as filling a glass with water, right? Sometimes the glass gets down a little bit, but to be filled with the Spirit, you've got to fill it back up. But you don't want to put it in a dirty cup, right? So being full of the Holy Spirit starts with being flushed of sin through confessing your sin, receiving God's forgiveness, going back to the Word, and meditating on your identity in Christ, and you become full of the Holy Spirit as you respond, as you trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be full of the Holy Spirit <laughs> but to trust and obey. Now, we read something else. Now, some of you are full of the Holy Spirit, you are very conscientious about confessing your sin and, and being pure in God's eyes. But it says Barnabas was also full of faith. Faith is in direct proportion to the things that you wind up going and doing for the Lord, that you can believe he can work through you to make a difference in your school, in your home, in your workplaces, in your church, in your community. You have to have faith that he will help you be part of taking people from where they are to where God wants them to be. Barnabas never put the emphasis on what he could do. He knew that God could do anything. And even though Barnabas knew the Roman Empire had big problems, he knew what? That God was bigger than the Roman Empire. And you need to know that about your city, state, country, and world right now, don't you? This world has problems much bigger than anything we can help with in the flesh, right? The flesh is always going to take us to divide up and fight, right? It, uh, wars within you, James talks about, from the flesh. And it happens between Christians. It happens between everybody out there in the world. But God is bigger than the world. God's bigger than the problems we have. So he can do through us what we could never do in our own strength. 
Barnabas never stopped believing that. Have some of you stopped believing that? Oh, the world's going to hell in a handbasket, nothing we can do. Come, Lord Jesus, come, get me out of here. Barnabas never stopped believing that things could change because God was working through him. That's why he accepted the assignment to go to Antioch. When Barnabas came, it says he saw the grace of God, what God had done in the lives of these disciples, and three things happened. First of all, he was glad. He would have loved that hymn, I love to tell the story. Love to hear testimonies about what God is doing in other people's lives. Barnabas loved hearing about how people had gone from ain'ts to saints and how God had done that. He just loved hearing those testimonies. But he also, secondly, encouraged them to live a purpose-driven life. Do you see what it says there? With purpose of heart, he was telling them to continue with the Lord. God has a purpose and plan for every life. And so, first, for the non-Christian, they need to meet the Lord and then with God inside of them, the Holy Spirit inside of them, they can now really discover God's purpose and plan for their life. Sometimes I sum it up by talking about 4G living. You know, that you're supposed to do everything you do for the glory of God, the good of your fellow man, to get the gospel to non-believers, and to help your fellow believers grow. Barnabas encouraged them that they would make a difference. They could proactively serve God, and it wouldn't matter that they did. And then we see that led to a third thing that Barnabas knew. <laughs> he needed help! Oh my goodness! People got saved before he was there. There was a whole mess of them. When he talked to them about the purpose-driven life, even more people were saved. I need help, he said. And you can almost see him there thinking, oh my gosh, self, who do I know that really knows both the Jewish mind and the Greek mind? Lord, I've been a Jew my whole life, so all I know is my Jew, the Jewish mind, and yet all these Greek guys, they've got such questions that I haven't even studied and don't know how to answer. Lord, what do I do? And then he thought, wait a second. About a decade ago, I met a guy, Saul of Tarsus. And, oh, what a thinker that guy was. And we sent him from Jerusalem back up to Tarsus when there was persecution. I wonder if he's still there. So he sent him an email, right? No, it's a lot easier today. Text or email. Hey, dude, what you doing? But he said, okay, last I knew he was in Tarsus. Years had passed. But he said, that's the guy I need to help. So he went to Tarsus, it says, and sought him out. So what did he do? Barnabas recruits Saul for the work in Antioch. Look at verses 25 and 26. It says, Depart Barnabas departed for Tarsus to seek Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. So it was that for the whole year... They assembled with the church and taught a great many people. Now, folks, in a moment, I want to talk to you about team ministry because what happened among them was team ministry, just like the apostles were doing back in Jerusalem. But I want you to think about this for a moment. Saul had been, at least in part, responsible for the death of Stephen, and some of these guys knew Stephen, right? Saul had been responsible for the arrest and death of others probably too, and some of them knew those guys as well. Certainly his reputation would have preceded them. Some of Stephen's associates had probably been the one that brought the gospel to Antioch. And if his fellow deacon that we mentioned was from Antioch, the proselyte from Antioch, if Nicholas, that guy, if that guy, wasn't Nicholas the other one? Okay. But if that guy was there, he would have been personally aware that Stephen's life had been snuffed out in part because of Saul. I'm guessing the first inclination of those friends of Stephen there in Antioch was not to vote yes for the new associate pastor candidate. I bet they thought, wait a second, we agree that work needs to be done, but not that guy. Do you know what he did? I mean, life's too short to interact with somebody like that that was responsible for such pain and heartache in our past. I'm not going to do it. But that's not what happened. Somehow they worked through that and Saul was received to help with the work there. And that takes humility both ways, doesn't it? It takes a Saul saying, I, I know where I've seen you before. You were crying over Stephen's body after we killed him. And I was thinking about arresting and hurting you too. And the other's like, yeah, that was me. Forgiveness had to flow. It had to be asked for and then it had to be received. It had to flow both ways, didn't it? Folks, when I think of that, I find great hope for our nation during this time of unrest. Saul coming to Antioch to help with the church shows how the grace of God makes it possible for forgiveness to flow and walls to be torn down. Things that used to separate us, not to separate us anymore. And that's being modeled at this church in Antioch. 
No wonder, verse 26 ends with saying, and the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. Do you know what Christian means? Little Christ. And we've kind of studied and we think that it wasn't the Christians called themselves this. They were content to call themselves followers of Jesus. It looks like it was a derogatory term given to them by their critics. Oh, those Christians, they act like Jesus did. They're little Jesuses. They're little Christ. They forgive just like he told them to and like he did. And, and they're breaking down walls that have separated ethnicities and others just like Jesus did with Jews and Samaritans. And he told that parable the Good Samaritan insisting that his people would be the kind of people that would make Christ first and forgiveness to flow and relationship to build upon his name. <laughs> And those people that probably sneered said, I can't believe those little Christs are doing that. Those little Jesus are doing that. It's all so unworkable in this world. <laughs> now listen to me, brothers and sisters. Don't you ever join the world in calling Christ's teachings unworkable. There are people in this room, and you do not believe that Christ's teachings are workable in this world. You've already said, hey, we'll all get to heaven and it'll get sorted out there. I don't really believe his teaching can be applied in this world. He knows what he asked us to do is impossible without us walking in faith. He knew it. You can't, but God never said you could. Jesus can in and through you, and he promised that he would. So what he commands you to do, he empowers you to do. Us, what he commands us to do, he empowers us to do through the power of the Holy Spirit. We must allow his spirit to do through us what none of us could do in our own strength. When we do what he commands us to do, it changes the world for the better. Don't you believe that it can't be done? Don't you believe that it's not workable? If people call you naive, get called naive. Be part of Christ's solution on this planet. G.K. Chesterton said, The Christian faith has not been tried and found wanting. It's been found difficult and not tried. But the reality is, when we step forth in faith and do what he tells us to do, he's empowering us to do it, and we encourage one another as we do it. If you don't have anybody in your life accusing you of being like Jesus, you're doing something wrong. You're doing something wrong. Paul was later able to say, imitate me as I imitate Christ. And that's what I want for your life and my life, that you're so answering the question, what would Jesus do? And people see you doing it, that they say, there's a little Jesus right there. They're bringing a, little, they're bringing a lot of Jesus around as a church. Little Christ, Christians, make imitating Christ your passion. Well, the final challenge, folks, be part of a team ministry like Barnabas and Saul. Pastor Lamar was right when he always said, find something around here and put your name on it. Even if the something around here is something that God's pit crew. Find something around here and put your name on it. I believe that just as we call for the tithe and obedience to the Lord, you ought to tithe your time also. You work 40 or 50 hours, I think you ought to spend four or five hours every week in some kind of ministry, doing it as unto the Lord. Now, folks, Jesus uh, told the parable of the Good Samaritan where one guy helped another guy by himself, right? And there are times where you're the only one there. Go ahead and help. Praise the Lord, right? But Jesus modeled for us ministering with his disciples as a team, didn't he? How did Jesus send his disciples out? Two by two, right? Matthew 10, the, uh, the 12. Luke 10, the 70. Two by two, they went out. Philip, the deacon, led the Ethiopian man to Christ. And if you're the only one there to witness, by all means do it. But that wasn't the way they did it in the New Testament mostly, was it? When they planned, when they executed strategy... They ministered in teams. So how does Acts primarily show the disciples ministering? In teams, right? And so we want to place a lot of emphasis on team ministry around here. Barnabas knew two things. First of all, he knew that the saints in Antioch needed more help than he alone could give them. Secondly, he knew that Saul over there in Tarsus had more to give to the Lord in ministry than he was presently giving. And Barnabas, once again, just as he had brought Saul and the apostles together for discussion and acceptance a few chapters ago, now he brings the new saints in Antioch together with all the ones that needed Christ in Antioch with Saul, who understood the Greek mind as well as he understood the Hebrew mind and could be the bridge to the gospel and growth for them. What a guy Barnabas was and is in heaven now with the Lord. 
Folks, team ministry helps the church of the present and the church of the future. Present work is done while leaders are raised up for the future. Think about what was at stake. If Barnabas had not done this for Saul, Saul would have still gone to heaven. He probably still would have lived in Tarsus, though, and made an impact there. But he had so much more to give. There was gold in Saul ready to be spent for Christ's glory. And there's gold in them that are pews, as John Maxwell likes to say. There's something that God has for you. Now, 13 books of the Bible wouldn't have been written, perhaps, if this moment hadn't come. All the churches that Saul planted, that planted other churches, that planted other churches, guess what? They weren't doing a lot of that out of Jerusalem yet. They said, hey, it's happening up there spontaneously. Let's go make sure it's happening the right way. So they sent Barnabas up there, but Saul and Barnabas together became a church planting movement that led the Roman Empire to Christ so much quicker as it mushroomed out. And we'll see that in these weeks to come. Of course, folks, for team ministry to emerge in Antioch, Barnabas had to have the heart to recruit a co-worker, and Saul, the co-worker, had to say yes. And the same exact thing is true today. Just a couple more minutes, then we're done. But let's relate this to the days we're in. Because of coronavirus, many of our ministries have been somewhat on hold. We've started back our adult and youth Sunday school classes with plans for the children's ones to resume August 9th. Awana will start back in either August or September. You know the truth. Many of our ministries are only currently able to be done because of faithful servants who are over the age of 65 years of age. God bless them. There are Barnabases. There are Barnabas. They are pouring their hearts and lives out for the kingdom of God. Many of them need to be more careful than they've ever been before. For some of them, it won't make sense to come back and start teaching again or to start this ministry again. That needs to wait till later on. I mentioned in my prayer, I talked to Pastor Lamar this week. And because of he and Debbie's health, that's exactly what he's doing. He's just being very careful, as he should be, right? And so there may be others that it just is not prudent to start back in that interaction. And we totally and completely understand, right? Everyone needs to do what works out best for them in consultation with their kids and grandkids and those things. For those who do start back, let me encourage you to think like Barnabas. To not just do the work through addition, but to think about multiplication. Who can I bring alongside? Who, God, will you lead me to a person to bring alongside to be another co-worker? Recruit yourself a Paul or a Pauline to join you in the work. As the weeks pass, give them more responsibility. It's not just that they're your helper and you're doing all the work. Let them teach part of the lesson. Let them share the testimony. Let them lead in the prayer. As time passes, give them more responsibility, just as was happening with Barnabas and Saul as they co-taught there. Do expect them to grow and serve as a faithful and fruitful follower of Jesus Christ. Don't expect them to do everything the way Miss Hunley did. The message never, ever changes, but the methods get adapted for the audience and the generation. Now, for those of you who are like Saul of Tarsus, right? Going through his life there in Tarsus, wondering if God had something more for him or her. If someone recruits you to one of our ministries, begin praying about saying yes. The world doesn't need any more yes men, but it needs a lot more yes lords. Yes lords. And it might be herky-jerky. You might say yes, and it's not your gifting, like, say, leading singing wasn't for me, right? Some of it's trial and failure and a reorientation to where your gifts are better served serving the kingdom, right? So that's going to happen along the way. There's going to be some disappointments. There's going to be great joy. As you serve and as the church sees you serve, over time it becomes your perfect area of service and opportunity. But there are so many great opportunities to serve here. Don't wait for somebody to ask, to inquire. A whole bunch of people that could be a Barnabas will leave here saying, that was a great message and then never do anything about it. And the same thing will be true with many of the possible Sauls of Tarsus who could go to another level of service for the Lord. Nice message, preacher. 
I hope somebody else says yes when they ask. Oh, no, I can't do that. I'm sorry. I, I can't adjust my schedule at all. If God is already impressing something on your heart, you take the initiative because, unfortunately, it doesn't always come toward you. So say, what about this? What about that? And our people will help you hopefully find your area of service for the Lord. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for how Barnabas went to Tarsus and found Saul. And one of the greatest tag team ministries ever began that day that led not just to fabulous and wonderful things happening in Antioch for the Lord, but throughout the Roman Empire. And probably there are people in this room whose spiritual conversion goes back to somebody who goes back to somebody who goes back to somebody who goes back to somebody to what happened with Saul and Tarsus there in Antioch. Lord, I pray for the Barnabases in this room, Lord, those who are a great encouragement, have ministered to you for years. Lord, I pray that you'll give them Saul's as time passes too. There's so much to learn. They have so much to teach our Saul's, Lord God. May this be a church where leadership development happens a lot and all the time. And Lord, I pray for our Saul's out there. They have things to offer too, Lord. Fresh ideas and enthusiasm, God. And I pray they'll say yes when asked, Lord God. That they'll find their place of service, Lord God. And that you will put these things together. And just as at Antioch, Lord, the gospel witness grew and the church grew. May the same be true here in the tabernacle and beyond. Do what you want to do in the life of our church, God. In Christ's name we pray. God bless you.